Hello everyone. Thank you for coming to the session today. Uh, today we have uh, Christopher o, uh, Dr. Christopher o Di Martino, a, uh, assistant professor at uh, Zhejiang University and uh, Un University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and also an adjunct professor, adjunct assistant professor at the University of Illinois Albana Shamban. Sorry, Christopher, it's too long. <laughs> and he will be talking about uh, open seas uh, and uh, academic user experience point of view. So thank you, Christopher, for presenting here. And it's all yours now. Thank you, Pavan. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, let me move. It's important. Uh, can you please confirm me? You can see the screen. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. First of all, Paran, and thank you for the introduction. My name is Cristoforo De Martino, and as you said, I'm an assistant professor here in China at Zhejiang University. Uh, I will introduce myself in the first slide. I think it's important before to start to introduce myself. Um, the title of my presentation, in any case, is Open Seas, the experience of an academic user. I'm not a developer. Mm, I think the definition of myself is not... a. I'm not also the most experienced maybe guy in open seas, but you know, since I used open seas for my research activities, for my academic activities, I decided together with Pavan to try to share with you my uh, background and experience. Um, before to start, I think it's important to say why I'm doing this job. Uh, basically, the explanation is not so complex. It happens that my father was a structural engineer, so uh, I decide, you can see myself on the left side and my father on the right side of the slide. So following his suggestion, at some point, I decide to try to uh, be like him after high school, you know, and then, you know, uh, life make me a structural engineer. Um, I think it's important to remember that um, I am a civil engineer, so civil engineering is quite different from other fields like mechanical engineer. Uh, because um, we have, uh, I always like to repeat, we have three main differences. The first one is that we are dealing with larger uncertainties compared to the uh, other areas. For instance, uh, if you want to design a car, the uncertainties are surely less because you can reduce the uncertainties. We don't have generally prototypation compared to other areas. So this changed the way we are working. And uh, generally we are a poor area. When I am saying that civil engineering is a poor area, I'm not saying that the global market is poor. Everybody knows that in the world that civil engineering global market is the biggest in the world. As you know, surely you know, the, the, the concrete is the most adopted material after water. But I would like to say that in terms of uh, amount of money you are generally spending for the design, uh, civil engineering is generally, uh, let's say, a relatively cheap word. If you compare the amount of money stored in a design of an airplane with a bridge, uh, you can easily understand that, that there is a mismatch. So um, why I'm saying this? Because all the decisions we are taking in civil engineering should be based on these three important constraints. So our approaches in design and also the way we are using finite element software to support our decision it's quite different from other fields. Um, my experience, let's say, we can say is, someone can say is international, you know, world is so big, but by the way, I started to study in Italy, then I moved in uh, Denmark. You can see my hometown uh, uh, highlighted with a heart in the lower part of the, in the south of Italy. Um, then I moved to China, you know, I spent one, one year at United, in the United States in, at UIUC. Uh, I started from my um, small university near my hometown in uh, Reggio Calabria. Then I had a second master degree at the University of Rome, La Sapienza, in seismic engineering. Then I did my PhD in the same years, you know, at the University of Naples. Um, I moved uh, with several positions of uh, researcher, adjunct professor, and so on, um, uh, moving in China, first at Nagin Tech University. And then, you know, I, moved, I accepted the position at Zhejiang University. And last year, I also obtained the adjunct assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, this is my institute. So now I know it's very difficult to travel uh, due to COVID-19 restrictions. But in any case, all of you are very welcome to come and to visit uh, our institute. It's located in Ainin. 
Ainin is a small city in Zhejiang province between Anzhou and Shanghai. Um, you can see uh, a picture of our institute. We have several international institutes in particular, as I said before, I'm working in this GGU UIUC Institute, which is an institute joined with UIUC. Uh, we have several positions, you know, and if some of you is interested to join, please uh, con feel free to contact me uh, to be supported both as a PhD or postdoc, but as well, uh, we are hiring several positions as a faculty, uh, so you can submit your application. Um, also, my research area, let's say, my the general, I like to define myself as a structural engineer. Um, so, you know, sometimes many researchers are deciding to focus on a specific topic. For me, I, I like to study whatever is structural engineering. So when there is a structure behind, I think it's interesting to study it. So according to this definition, I have a broad uh, research interest in, in structural engineering. Um, my PhD was in particular devoted to wind engineering, which is one of my core uh, research topics. So I studied the problem of our elastic behavior of cables and uh, the identification and probabilistic identification of wind profiles. Uh, then I did during the, my second master earthquake engineering and still I'm working on earthquake engineering. Um, I like a lot to, to investigate the problem of human-induced vibration because I think it's quite interesting to investigate how humans, when they are walking, are transferring forces to a bridge. Uh, then, you know, since I had a big project at the time in, when I moved to China, uh, I studied the impact behavior of structures. Here in China, I'm working a lot of the bamboo structures and the use of recycled concrete. But let's move to the core of our talk today. Today, the talk is about the... Um, Open seas, so I decide to uh, try to discuss with you and share my ideas in 10 questions. Um, so I will try to discuss and reply about these 10 questions with you. I think that this will uh, spark the discussion more than a reply to this question. They are very complex questions, but I think before to use open seas or use whatever finite element software, it's important that we are thinking about these 10 questions. Let's start, uh, I mean, with the start. The first important question, why we need FEM? So uh, FEM is mean, means finite element model, but let's start with the first question. So because, you know, OpenSys is a software we are adopting for solving structures as civil engineering. I don't know if some of you is not civil, but in any case, as engineers, uh, we need to think why it's important to use this. Uh, the story of solving structure is very old, okay, we can start several years ago with, uh, you know, my connational Leonardo da Vinci, he started to think about the deflection of a beam, uh, he made several mistakes, you know, in the assumptions, you know, behind it, but, you know, after that, the first guy, you know, tried to make some sense in the solution of a beam was Galileo Galilei, and as you know, nowadays, if we have to solve a problem like this, um, this is something I'm teaching to my students, you know, how to calculate the deflection of a clamped beam. We can solve very easily. We have a simple equation, we have a mechanical model, and so on. So we can calculate forces, we can predict the internal forces such as bending moment, shear, and so on, and we can solve it easily, and potentially we can design and predict the mechanical behavior of the structural element. What is the problem is that when we are moving to no statically determined structure, let's take for instance this um, frame structure with a applied horizontal force, the equations start to be much more complex. This is another exercise I'm generally assigning to my, to my students in the introduction to structural analysis class. Uh, you can see that the equations start to be very complex, you need a lot of time to solve it, and uh, you know, in any case, it's very difficult to write the equations and to control the solution. Uh, but in any case, it's still something we can continue to solve by hand. What is the problem? At some point, you know, uh, we start to deal with complex, more complex structure, and then, you know, hand calculations start to be very, very complex. Uh, first of all, because you cannot control, and second, you know, um, you know, it was it was quite difficult, you know, to uh, to predict the solution and to be sure that we are not doing mistakes. In some way, you know, we can con control the mistakes using some iterative solution, but in any case, it's quite difficult to control the solution. Um, we can apply simplified model always to solve it. We will discuss later about the use of simplified model because it's very important to control the solution. But remember, in general, it's quite difficult to solve this. Uh, during the last, uh, you know, 40, 50 years, we created a very fast, stupid machine. That's my definition of a computer, you know. 
nowadays I'm continuously hearing about artificial intelligence, but I think we are still very far to have something that can uh, emulate broadly uh, the human intelligence. But computer is very fast. Uh, when I mean stupid, I mean is only solving the uh, operations we are asking him to solve much faster than us. And, you know, we can use computer to solve structure. This basically uh, induced the development of the finite element approach. Uh, basically, the finite element method, uh, this should be keep in mind because, you know, many people are not thinking about this. It's basically a discretization of the original partial differential equation problem governing the mechanics of a structure, okay? Um, I'm highlighting this, I'm, I can imagine that for the majority of the people in the audience here it's obvious, but it's important to remember this concept because, you know, uh, the finite element method is basically a discretization of the problem. We are uh, creating a discrete model basically by inserting discrete elements, which, are, which we are calling nodes, joining the different elements. Okay, there is a word and there are thousands of books you can study about this and you are highly encouraged to, write, to, to read the theory before to start. We will discuss in another question about this. But in any case, please remember that finite element from a simplified point of view is a discretization of the problem. So uh, using finite element, basically we can have a very complex domain uh, with very complex forces. And uh, you can see we can discretize this domain in several elements with nodes connected by, in nodes connected by elements. We have a lot of elements and in open seas as well, we have a lot of elements implemented. We will see it later. But looking at the general framework, the idea of finite elements is that you have the nodes and in the middle you have the element reproducing the mechanical interaction between, or the physical, let's say, more general sense interaction between these nodes with some rule. For instance, when we are using the elastic beam column element, you can see here, we are assuming a certain deformed shape of the beam according to a theory. Generally, we are using the Euler-Bernoulli or you can use the Timoshenko theory. But in any case, you are assuming a certain behavior between the, the two elements. Uh, this behavior in any case uh, is generally uh, interpolated, let's say, or is an interpolation between these two nodes and uh, all the action force generally are moved to these nodes. This is very important and I think it's a, a very um, fundamental source of error in the idealization of the numerical model we would like to implement. The second question, I think, is more challenging than the first question. What is the best software for finite element analysis? Uh, generally speaking, let's start to understand what is a software for finite element analysis. A software, generally speaking, is made by three parts. Uh, we have the pre-processing phase, the solution phase, and the post-processing phase. Uh, OpenSys, basically, in the first version, is only accounting for the solution phase. So this means that we don't have any tool for pre-processing, and we have very, very simplified tools, uh, tools for post-processing. Generally, users are thinking about the first and last phase, I mean, the normal users. They are not taking care so much about the solution phases because the software is giving us the solution. That's the typical sentence I'm hearing, especially from students, you know, the computer is solving for us. But, you know, uh, according to my first uh, um, definition, the computer is a stupid machine very fast. So if we don't know exactly what a stupid is doing, you know, the uh, proposed approach can be very dangerous for the user in this case, which uh, who is the real person, which we will use at the end the solution. So users like very well, very a lot pre-processing and post-processing. All the companies in the world know very well this. In fact, they are generally advertising the capabilities of the pre-processing and post-processing. It's very rare that a company is advertising the solution capabilities because, you know, the community of people uh, understanding, you know, the real solution strategy for finite element is very small compared to the people who can understand, you know, pre-processing and post-processing. In particular, you can see very well that uh, people loves, uh, love a lot the uh, animated output at the end, so they can see something very well. Let's try to see, you know, the um, king of software. I will not express clearly any negative or positive idea about this software. It's a very good software, commercial software used by the several engineers. But you can see very well that uh, here, um, 
you can have a very nice interface. You can model your structural system. You have several, you know, uh, buttons. So you can use your uh, lovely uh, human computer interface, the mouse, you know, so you can input everything by mouse. You don't have, potentially, you don't have to use the keyboard, you know, you can, unless to write some numbers, you know, you can input all the structure by using the uh, mouse. And this is something which is very appreciated by, uh, you know, uh, user and the students like it a lot you know they can control their geometrical model they can see it very well for instance this uh, you know it's a model developed by my student in sub 2000 uh, this is another advertisement we are participating now to the solar decathlon competition in china it's a model of this structure in uh, is a bamboo uh, based structure with some frame elements it's modeled in sub 2000 we have a similar model in open seas but you can see from a student point of view this is very simple you know and can be implemented very easily you know um, and um, you know sometimes people are saying you know well the problem is that i cannot input complex geometry with a closed uh, with a software with an interface but that's not true because you know um sub 2000 for instance is provided with an api so you can potentially you know this is some image taken online but i mean um you can search online easily api sub 2000 or api whatever software whatever commercial software and you can easily you know connect your software to whatever database and you can have some whatever complex parametric model what is the problem of this all commercial or majority of the commercial software let's say plus uh, let's say a strong or less problem depending on the company so i'm not expressing any let's say idea about what i think is that if you are going to the manual basically you will find some information like that this is the manual you can see online of sub 2000 for instance convergence tolerance is uh, okay uh, something we will discuss later as well in this presentation you will see here that basically you will have the information about how to use something but you have no idea how this is programmed inside so if you want to really understand inside sub 2000 the way in which the convergence algorithm is checking you will never know because basically you cannot access to this at this point i think so the question uh rise by himself so is open source an alternative we will try now to understand what is open source together the typical uh, dilemma i mean all the people from many times from companies and from especially for students you know starting is we would like to have a proprietary software or open source software proprietary software means a software similar to sub 2000 or all the other software you know very well from a commercial company uh, generally, the main reason because students are deciding to uh, adopt a open source software is the following, you know, you have the student and the student is saying my supervisor is poor, he will never buy uh, for me expensive software, I need to find a free open source software. There are thousands of uh, alternative, you know, for whatever software you can imagine, it depends on the people you know this is not advertisement of software but you know many people prefer open source but generally the main reason to replace a proprietary software is because it's free i think this is the first mistake people are understanding when they are using open source software because the definition of open source is not free software um, before to move and understand what is a open source software we have to understand i mean what is the difference between the different software we have three macro classification in the software ecosystem uh, we have the so-called proprietary software we can see we have closed source software uh, we have some demos shareware freeware and abandonware uh, the last one abandonware means basically a software still with a company uh, registered it but not developing anymore and maybe the company disappeared from the market so it's a software basically not controlled anymore but in any case in the, the proprietary software you are not free to control or modify the software generally you can only use it under the function uh, given let's say uh, given or uh, authorized by the company then there is a large amount of non-proprietary software there are some software public domain means basically the code is there and you can do whatever you want there is no copyright or copyleft and then you know another important class is the open source software basically in the open source software there is a maintainer we will see in a while what is a maintainer and the maintainer is controlling that the community is evolving in a way uh, which is basically can continue can can guarantee 
uh, that there is a compatibility between the different versions. And you know, finally, there are commercial software, but potentially also open source software can be uh, can be sold, can be sell online. You know, for some reason. So, what, how does it work? Why the companies can guarantee that we cannot see that what's going on inside the software? The explanation is the following: basically, all the software are based on a source code. So we have some instruction written. You can see in some way. Um, human can understand C++, for instance, can be, you know, a way or Python or TCL or whatever other language. Generally, all this information are given to a compiler. The compiler is transforming this information in some binary uh, code. So you can see we have an object file. At the end, you can see this object file basically is a binary, so we cannot understand it anymore. And generally, to go back to the source code is quite complex. We have to use some reverse engineering approach. So this means that basically the companies are protecting themselves by this step, you know, because then you cannot understand anymore what's inside. Okay, then there is some linker, generally a some library, and you can run your software in your computer, like generally you are doing with OpenSys when you have your lovely Excel file. But you can know from the Excel file, you cannot understand what's going on in the software. So the reason because you can understand what's going on inside OpenSys is because uh, you have the software inside. So let's try to understand a little bit more what is the complexity of the community and why it's important to have a community behind the uh, open source. This is a video taken from YouTube, so some frame I will share with you is uh, made by Intel to explain the concept of uh, open source. So let's imagine to have the uh, maize grandma who, uh, who made a nice receipt to prepare a cake. She will send to all the world this receipt, let's say like open seas, you know, was sent to all the world and all the people are receiving it. At some point, you know, the, the people will start to cook this cake and then they say, oh, I can change it a little bit. Okay. Or I can have some uh, difference. Okay. So there are cookies in the story. I say cake, but I mean, it's the same concept and they are providing some modifications. Similar, you know, the users in the world, you know, they are creating some modifications. So basically at some point we have several authors all over the world changing our version of the code, adding new function, changing and so on. What is the problem? The problem is that, you know, uh, basically they can create different branches so they can create different uh, software solving the uh, different uh, functions, different solutions, improvement, and so on. The problem is that we have to be sure, you know, at some point that all these uh, components are working together. So the grandma should work as a maintainer. So this is the main concept of an open source community. Be sure that the different parts of this software are uh, compatible in the main software. This is something that really, if you are not a very expert of uh, uh, computer problems, you don't realize. But when you are developing thousands of different versions of a software, the key problem is to be sure that when you join all together, they are working in a proper way together. This is called compatibility. So this is a very important thing in an open source community. The role of maintainer is to not to uh, stop the freedom of users, but to be sure that the community is evolving together. Please keep in mind as well the concept of community, which is crucial for uh, the development of an open source community. So if you are interested, I would like also to share you two books. I mean, they are quite interesting to understand the logic of open source software. I uh, read both of them. So I'm, I highly encourage you guys to read it because they are quite interesting to understand why we need a community. And uh, please uh, let me say now in the middle of the presentation why we need people like Pavan, you know, uh, donating uh, his time, you know, to the development of open source community. So uh, generally, you know, uh, why open source, open source start at some point? You have your supervisor here. You can say the guy at some point is saying, okay, please use open source for your simulation. You can see the guy is getting crazy. The supervisor generally has no idea about open source. He heard in several... Uh, conferences about open seas and uh, you say simple no everyone is using open seas that's a general idea so when you start to use open seas the first question is to understand why this is an open source software so I mean what is the difference i will try to show you two links uh, let me try to show you these two link to understand why we can uh, maybe i open the same link let me see this I think it's the same link. Huh? 
okay it's the same link okay let me open only the, there is a problem with the link but let's go to the open seas page uh, so if you click to user documentation you can find the so-called command manual i'm sure you know very well the common manual but this is the crucial point to understand the element let's take the simplest one elastic beam column element as you can see here here we have a description okay of the elastic beam column element in fact we are in the user section of the manual and this is quite similar to what i've shown you before for the sub 2000 manual so here basically you cannot understand the way in which the software is handling this element. So you can understand the input and you can understand in some way the output. They are not reported here. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, your video is not on, just. Sorry? Uh, we can't see you, only hear you. Your video is off. Uh, yes, why is off? Now it's okay? Uh, no, still can't see you. Uh, so you cannot I, I see me. See okay, okay, the camera. Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Now we can see. Okay, you. okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, my mistake. Okay, uh, thank you, Pavan. Um, this is the typical okay uh, menu. So you can see we have something very similar, okay, to what we are generally seeing in a sub two thousand manual. And you can see here, this is the difference with a normal software. Here you can enter, you know, in the user section. So if some of you is interested, maybe I can explain you how to enter, but I mean, it's not difficult. It's recently all the uh, code moved to GitHub. I think this was a very good improvement because now we can uh, easily enter and we can see the different uh, modifications of the software. But you can see very important in these lines of code, we can see very well all the details about the way in which the element is programmed and we can really understand the way is programmed. This is very important as well as a user, okay? I never developed an element or a material in OpenSys, but I am continuously con using and searching information here to better understand the way in which the code is working. Okay, let's move to another question. What is the, pre the problem with the first experience with OS? We have seen, okay, that generally the supervisor, okay, is asking you uh, to use the open seas. It happens to me during my master degree, you know, my second master degree in a similar way. In Italy, we had an important earthquake in Emilia Romagna in 2012. Uh, the majority of damage were for industrial buildings, you know, and that that time, you know, my supervisor asked me to do several simulations, okay, of uh, precast industrial buildings and to try to understand the mechanical behavior of this. Um, this earthquake was very important, you know, because in Emilia-Romagna area is a very industrialized area in Italy, so everyone was very worried about the economic damage. Um, and so for this reason, you know, many, many researchers all over the world studied the problem of these precast industrial buildings, uh, mainly because for economical reason, and you can see the companies reported here. Uh, the main damage observed were flexural hinges at the base of the precast columns, and the very important, as you can see in this image here, the large sliding of the beam to column connection, which were basically uh, frictional uh, connections um, without any mechanical device. Uh, you can see here generally that um, the connection was made uh, using elastomeric bearing pad. Uh, we didn't have any mechanical connections. And during the earthquake, uh, these connections uh, failed because very weak to, to horizontal actions, but very strong for vertical actions, so working very well under normal conditions. Uh, this was a very complex problem because you had a, a frictional elements in where, you know, one of the key elements to explain the reason of this um, failure was the vertical component of the earthquake. You can easily understand that the vertical component of the earthquake is changing the, um, is changing basically the frictional force or the frictional resistance you have at the connection, basically um, with positive or detrimental effect in terms of the capacity of the beam to slides. So um, we started with a statistical analysis to try to understand the full uh, behavior of this population of buildings. You can see some, um, examples, but basically when you are dealing with probabilistic value and you are a young guy, the most simple approach you can have is a Monte Carlo simulation, so you will have your uh, probabilistic variables and you want to simulate your system thousands of times. 
or millions of times sometimes. So the problem is that if you want to use normal software, you know, you will be crazy, but with OpenSys, you know, I find my word. So basically uh, the idea is that you have to solve a uh, equation of a dynamic system like that one uh, with some um, probabilistic variable. And the main problem is the definition as well of the pro co coefficient of frictions. I don't know if you had experience with this, but I'm sure if you had experience, you can you know very well that the variability of the coefficient of, of friction is very high due to a series of reasons such as uh, temperature and so on. So when you start uh, to use OpenSeas, the first thing you connect to the website, like just with it, and you know the feeling you have, I think, is like in this picture, you feel lost and alone, right? You feel like you don't know what to do exactly, you know, because when you download a commercial software, let's take again only as an example, sub 2000. Uh, you can uh, install in your computer, you know, and you can easily use it. You know, when you download OpenSeas in your computer, you know, generally I can start my terminal, you know, uh, digit OpenSeas, you know, and what you will see, you know, is exactly this. It's not exactly the same feeling as we have seen before, okay, this in TCL environment. I have to say that nowadays the condition is much better because you can find uh, many videos, tutorial, you know, the community is working very hard to improve, but this is the feeling you have. So um, before to start, you know, and this is my suggestion to all the new user is don't start to program, please, because programming is the last problem. Before to program, it seems something obvious, but it's very important to first think what you want to program. If you don't know what do you want to program, do you don't want exactly what your mechanical model will look like, you will never program it. I can see that sometimes, you know, um, the complexity in programming is only an excuse that people are using to uh, justify themselves. They don't know exactly the mechanical system they want to program. This is similar to what's going on with scientific writing. Many people are complaining about the complexity, especially the non-native speakers, of writing in English, but it's only an excuse. The real story is that they don't know exactly what they want to program. So my very important suggestion is before to start to program, please try to uh, use your uh, paper and a pen and try to understand exactly what is the model you want to develop. In this case, we have this model. You can see it's a coupled horizontal vertical model uh, where you have basically a, a element moving in the vertical direction. And you can see here, uh, you have some springs representing the horizontal direction and you have some damper and a frictional element with a three-dimensional earthquake behavior. In OpenSeas, you know, this model also we can be realized in a more complex way using distributed elements, like in this case. So we used um, fiber based, uh, fiber section based column element to represent the, the plastic behavior of the columns. Uh, we consider that the beam elements are uh, um, elastic. We have an additional node in the middle to reproduce the dynamic behavior, okay, without adding the mass the rotational mass uh, in the lateral nodes. And you can see here that we have basically these uh, parallel elements to reproduce the uh, frictional behavior under earthquake loads. And you can see that we have also a limit displacement device to uh, represent in some case the uh, cinematic constraints condition of the connections, okay? So before to start, it's quite important to have this model. Um, we did several analysis, something which is quite difficult, you know, to perform with other software. And I think another important key issue of OpenSeas is that is one of the main software developed for civil guys. Remember, many other software are generalists, so they are not realized thinking about the needs of civil guys. I start this presentation saying that uh, civil needs are sometimes different from mechanical needs, for instance. And uh, by the way, in this research project, so we uh, basically developed several simulations. And at the end, you know, for instance, in this figure, you can see the column displacement and the relative displacements at the connection. This is the average value, but you can basically have a probabilistic distribution for each cell. Um, as a function of the epicentral distance, okay, given the magnitude of the specific earthquake we had in Emilia-Romagna. 
and different friction coefficient. Basically, by a convolution of these two parameters, we can obtain basically the uh, um, risk analysis of this building. The convolution basically is um, on the probabilistic distribution of the friction, the frictional uh, coefficient you have at the connection, and the hazard function providing information about the epicentral distance or the magnitude distance of the event. Um, here you can see another case with large um, amount of steel, but I think the concept is similar. It's only uh, different dynamic behavior of the structure. We published this um, some years ago, let's say in a bulletin of earthquake engineering. So why I'm telling you about this experience? Because during this experience, I found my ecosystem. You know, I discussed with Pavan a little bit about the important development in uh, Open Sea Spy. Uh, unfortunately, you know, I am starting to be like uh, old professors. I'm not so old, but you know, uh, when I was, my, uh, I remember when I was master student, you know, my professor was working with the fourth one and I was uh, always saying, why this guy is not learning MATLAB? And you know, now I can really understand the advantage to using, uh, in using um, uh, Python, but you know, uh, when you use uh, MATLAB in the last maybe 12, 13 years of your life, you know, then to move to Python is not so easy, you know. Now, let's say I have a basic understanding of Python, but, you know, um, my word is under MATLAB. So I found this ecosystem. I'm, in any case, I'm not, not supporting OpenSyspy. I think is a very nice idea. But, you know, I think that whatever you can do there, you can do as well uh, using this, uh, let's say, my ecosystem. As you can see, I have MATLAB, which is the king of my ecosystem, so I'm running everything from MATLAB. Um, I'm running generally open seas, you know, from uh, MATLAB. Uh, MATLAB is exchanging some information with open seas, you know, writing a TCL file. We will discuss in a while about two strategies, writing the full TCL file or controlling some variables in the TCL file and having back, you know, some information, you know, from OpenSeas using some recorder in the TCL environment. This is the strategy I'm using. Um, and, you know, MATLAB is basically my pre and post processor. So let's move to the next question. So how MATLAB and OpenSys can work together? I mean, this is what I understood and the way I'm using. Let's say you want to model a simple frame. Okay, let's start with a simple model. This is an exercise I'm assigning to my students. It's a typical homework in OpenSys. Uh, you know, the typical way, let me open the... Uh, I should have a folder. Uh, the typical way you are modeling this, you know, you can write your code. This is a typical code. Uh, this is, I think, is a homework from one of my students, you know. Uh, you can write, you know, the code. You can write that. I generally divide my model in several parts. You know, generally I have a title section, the inputs at the beginning. So um, you can control the inputs at the beginning of the code. You can define the model. Okay, you know very well. I, I, uh, I don't have to explain you the different lines or... Um, the loads, you know, we can define the loads and we can have some recorders, okay, and so on. Another approach, you know, to solve it is to use MATLAB. I can show you the code that I'm generally using it. I have some function like this, you know. Let me start my MATLAB in my computer. Um, I have a first, you can see, MATLAB file. In this case, you will see a MATLAB file writing a full TCL file. And then I created some, my uh, personal, you know, um, functions, you know, to post-process the data. Uh, yes, let's try to, this is, you can see, when you are running OpenSys in this way inside MATLAB, basically you are entering to OpenSys environment, you are running like a, a DOS, let's say, or in this case, a terminal line inside MATLAB. It's a little bit annoying, the menu, yeah, sorry, the menu off. And you can see very well, this is something you can uh, basically create inside your MATLAB environment. If you are interested about details, please let me know. We developed these uh, libraries together with my friend uh, Francesco Marmo, uh, who is a researcher in Italy at the University of Naples, Federico Secondo. And you can see here, you can build easily. I think the quality of the, the post-processing is very good. You can have both a 3D view or you can have a live view. Then your model can be three-dimensional or more complex. You can see it's quite easy, you know, uh, to add different things. Basically, I create, you can see here, some uh, structured variables defined in the different parts of the code. 
And you can run the code and you can see, you can create whatever structure you want and use OpenSys in a full non-linear or linear way or dynamic uh, solver. Um, let's say this system is working very well. What is the only drawback we have here? The only drawback is that if you are running several, several situations from a computational point of view is not very efficient because in any case you are writing a TCL file. So, which is generally very fast. You are running the code, you know, this can be a little bit uh, not very fast. In any case, you know, you can build also three-dimensional structure. I can show you another example, but if you are interested in some example, let's say, let's discuss later, you can see, you can have uh, whatever type of structure. This is a, a four columns with a rigid diaphragm on the top, you know, where the, the master node located at the center, you have a torsion. Um, let's move with the uh, presentation. Let's move to the sixth question. Is it important to know the theory? This is a, a key point I want to share with you guys, because I think many guys are using, many students, I mean, especially are using a finite element software as a video game. Uh, this is the worst thing you can do. And um, generally, you know, this is the key point of a PhD, you know, maybe many of you know guys. Uh, you know, generally, this is the human knowledge, you know, you are improving your human knowledge at some point, you know, PhD means go outside from the boundaries, but to go outside of the boundaries, you know, you need to know whatever is behind you. This is a typical example, you know, and this is an homework I am assigning to my students, asking them how to, uh, how to solve it. And it's a typical problem, you know, very simple, but it's not implemented inside, uh, in, within the normal uh, libraries of OpenSeas, as far as I know. Um, so uh, the problem is that you don't have a triangular distributed load. This problem is very simple. I mean, all the students, I mean, undergraduate students can solve this very easily. But if you don't know the theory and the way to solve it in a finite element framework, you know, you will never solve it. Um, the first point, you know, is to go to the GitHub, you know, to study the way uh, in which the software is working. Go to GitHub, the, basically the Elastic Beam element. Here I have a note to go to line 699, but you can find easily. Uh, so here I will not spend time for the sake of shortness, but I need to explain what is this part. But basically here you have the information on the way in which the software is analyzing the end transforming a distributed load into a um, applied a, a, a nodal load which is used basically by the finite element model as i told at the beginning the finite element uh, approaches a discretization so whatever is on the element is transformed into a nodal load and these are the rules so if you don't know exactly these rules you know you will never know how to solve this problem um, my students, you know, are solving this in two different ways. If you are interested, again, I can show you. One simple solution, you know, is to add an additional node. You can see here, the node is applied at one third of the height. So this means you are applying an additional node and you are applying the equivalent load of this one at one third. It's well known that the equivalent load of a triangular load is applied at one third from the long side or one uh, two third from the point B in this case. And this is a solution. What is the drawback of this approach? That from a computational point of view, you will introduce an additional node and you will have some, a little bit, a slightly big matrix in this case to be inverted by the software. But you can also solve, you know, if you know a little bit about the uh, equivalent nodal loading, you can solve in a more structured way. These are the equivalent nodal node of a triangular load. So basically you can, skip the creation you can see here of the additional node you can see here um, and you can apply these equivalent loads to the node one and three the nodes one and three are basically the node a and node b and you can see if you know a little bit better the theory you can apply this node and then in the post-processing phase you can calculate in a proper way the internal phase I'm alighting this simple concept because if you don't know the theory, it will be basically impossible to solve as well simple uh, problems, okay? 
So uh, the typical two questions I'm finding, you know, uh, from students and uh, let's say from people also on the forum, you know, from you users, uh, the forum, I mean, the OpenSea's uh, Facebook page or whatever forum is which one should I use between these two? I will not spend time to, I mean, explain the details because we don't have time, but maybe, you know, Pavan, I can as well invite some friend, you know, to discuss about some more uh, theoretical things. I think this is also a suggestion for uh, next meeting. What is the difference between this, these two elements? Uh, you know, generally people, you know, they are using in a, without knowing very well what is the difference. I attached to the slide some small biography as, uh, with uh, where you can find information. But in any case, my suggestion, if you don't know exactly what is the difference in these two approaches, you are using randoms in a random way, and that's not the right way. And the next question with a theoretical problem behind is why the problem is not converging. You know, I'm sharing this because one student, I don't remember who is the student really, but you know, years ago told me I solved the problem of the convergence. I used this function, fixed number of iterations. I don't know if you are aware what does it mean, fixed number of iterations, but basically fixed number of iteration means that the computer is the, sorry, OpenSeas is not checking the convergence of the problem, is performing a certain number of iterations and then is stopping the analysis. I mean, this is the typical way in which a person uh, without any background on the uh, theoretical problem is solving the problem. For this reason, you know, I would like to stress again, before to start to code, please study the theory of finite elements and basics of programming like TCL. If you don't know TCL and you want to use TCL OpenSys, it's impossible to do it. Let's move to another interesting question. Is it possible to solve multi-physics problem? Let's say a traditionally OpenSys started as a, a software for solving structure in a single physics environment. But nowadays we have several problems. We have, we have several approaches. I will show you again another solution for wind turbines under uh, seismic and wind loads. Uh, in this case, the problem is basically is a coupled problem, so it's not still implemented. I'm not a mm, developer, but I am a user. But you can decouple the problem by assuming a certain aerodynamic damping or a certain function uh, decoupling, let's say, the component of the aerodynamic forces depending only on the wind speed and depending on the structural motion. There is an equation I used that one proposed by Valalamesh uh, to define the coupled damping between uh, the structural, the wind turbine and the wind force. And you can see in this case, I used my king, let's say MATLAB to, co to govern three softwares in this case. First, I used FAST, which is a um, open source software for the analysis of the wind turbines under wind speed. So with FAST, basically I created an input and this input, you know, was transferred to the OpenSys model, which is basically the force applied to the rotor. Here you can see that you have an aerodynamic damper, you know, representing aerodynamic because it's representing the interaction. And then together, simultaneously, I applied the earthquake load. I consider as well the P delta effect. For this reason, it's a nonlinear problem where I should consider the two actions together. And you can see here, we published some papers. Uh, this research then at some point we stopped for time constraints and because uh, let's say we move to new things, but I think the approach was very promising, you know, and I'm quite interested to continue in the near future. You can predict in a probabilistic way, basically the distribution you can see of the wind and uh, the um, earthquake force induced together. So nowadays we have much better solution and maybe, you know, for developer, this is something can be interesting, for instance, to join OpenSys with Fluent. Fluent is a uh, software, you know, for the aerodynamic solution of uh, bodies, but it can be joined maybe with OpenSys in the near future. But there is a very interesting uh, development in the tsunami analysys. This is taken from the OpenSys Pi manual. So you can see we can simulate multiphysics, but as well the interesting uh, um, OpenSys for fire developed by Usmani from uh, PolyU is as well quite interesting, you know, because they developed basically a multi-physics environment. The question, this is the main question, and this is the reason because I'm using OpenSys in, a, um, in this environment together with MATLAB and uh, other software, is because parametric model for me is crucial for research. I would like to, to give you another example of some research I did uh, in the last year. So I tried to analyze the behavior of timber um, light frame buildings, as well timber and bamboo one. 
uh, I told you at the beginning of the presentation that I have large projects on bamboo. Uh, here, the problem is how to analyze the behavior of this structure. You have an internal framing uh, made by uh, vertical elements called studs, and you have horizontal joists. And generally, you have some panel we call a sheeting panel connected with some nails. The problem is generally how to reconstruct the behavior of the full structure by starting, you know, from the behavior of the, of the nail. In this case, we started by the definition of the behavior of the nail of a micro scale. So we had some tests, uh, uh, in this case, we took taken from the literature, okay, about the behavior of this bolted or nail connection. So you can see this typical type, typical aesthetic cycles. We use uh, together in conjunction with MATLAB again, a, a differential evolution algorithm to find the variables. Okay, so basically we perform an optimization of the uh, source material in MATLAB, but you can use whatever material to do this. So this means that basically you have some experimental data and you can use a differential evolution algorithm to um, fit your data, but you can use uh, um, whatever type of algorithm. Um, in general, you cannot uh, use, uh, let's say, uh, traditional optimization because you have uh, large uh, uh, discontinuities in this. So you need something that, you know, can uh, skip the discontinuities. But I mean, this is a minor problem. In general, you can program your optimization problem. Again, going back, if you don't know what is an optimization problem, it's quite difficult to program it. So first, again, study the theory. And you can see here... Um, you can basically uh, reconstruct very well whatever phenomenological model. Once we had, you know, the behavior of the nail, the problem was how to build a full model. Okay, the model we decide to build again before to start to uh, write, try to understand the model, we have like an el elastic pin column element representing the uh, frame. Uh, we have some zero element to reproduce the rotational behavior. We have a panel, you know, modeled with a shell MITC4 elements. And then we have zero length elements with the nonlinear behavior similar to that one of the nail. So uh, a phenomenological model based on experimental results, joining the panel with the frame similar to the structure we want to build. Okay, the first things you can do, you know, is to start to model, you know, your code uh, by inputting, you know, all the nodes one by one. At some point, you will realize that you will get crazy, you know, will, uh, you will, because you cannot control this, you know, you have thousands of nodes and you will be crazy, okay? So it's impossible to control in this way. So at some point, you have to think in a different way. You should realize a parametric model because you want to change the typical, you know, engineering uh, uh, approaches to change the parameters of the model and to try to understand the behavior under different geometrical or mechanical parameters. So if you don't know how to program in a parametric way, you will be crazy and you will never finish, or you need thousands of students, you know, to be used and the risk of to make a mistake is very high. So in this case, we went back, we realized the full TCL model. So we basically, MATLAB is only providing some input file. In this case, you can see that we define several layers, okay, the layers are used to define the number of nodes. So we use the structural numbering of the nodes. The first layer, okay, is, um, for instance, the first number of the node is representing the layer and the other numbers are different representing, for instance, the location on the X, Y grid representing the different locations. Using this approach, you know, we have an exact coding for each node. I know the uh, number defining the, tag of the node will be huge, but this is not a problem. Remember, you can use whatever number. You can see an example of this wall here. And, you know, we used as well at the beginning this very interesting tool. I don't know if you are aware of this tool. OS Lite is a tool developed by a very nice uh, student. Uh, I know him personally. He's a Chinese guy, Jack Chen. You can connect to his website and download the software. You can basically input the TCL code on the right side of this uh, simple code. And you can see on the left side the preview of the model. So you can control very easily if the geometry of the model is working well. Very importantly, um, this software is working as well if you have some parametric models. So if, for instance, the TCL model is containing some four or some uh, while cycle environment. Um, so using this approach, basically, we simplified a lot the formulation. So you can see here, we can define some input. 
um, I will not spend a lot of time. I will try to speed up the presentation, okay? But in any case, we have some geometrical parameters defining the different parts, okay? Like the spacing of the nails, uh, where you have the nails, the number of nails, and so on. And uh, at the inside the TCL code, basically we have different uh, cycles like this, creating in a loop environment the different elements. In this case, you can see here, this is a typical cycle creating the node position. So uh, we have, for instance, a cycle starting from zero, creating the number of nodes. And you can see we have the same format we decided at the beginning, layer node base uh, with the dollar is the uh, layer we are considering for the node is the first number. Yet yeah, again, the number defining the tag is a little bit long, but in this way, you can know very well the location of the node and you can control your code. Why this is very important? This is very important because you can create in this way, okay, uh, your model, okay, this is our details in a parametric way. So this means that MATLAB is only defining some, an input TCL file providing only some uh, lines. And then within the TCL environment, every time when you change this line at the beginning, you will automatically change all the elements. This is a kind of complex element, but you can do it for whatever. We are working now with frames. We are working now with uh, other models and you can do it for whatever model and you can control your model in a parametric way and you can easily change the behavior. We did the same as well for a different class of wall with aperture, you know, so here you can see you have the aperture and you can change easily everything and we validate whatever all the models you can find in a, a recent paper published with uh, Giorgia Di Gangi uh, in, on engineering structure, I think last year. So you can find the model. But now we are uh, near to publish a paper describing, okay, the full procedure from an open source point of view. So um, this approach can be as well used for different structure. Recently, I'm working uh, on a new class of uh, active bending structure, like this one reported here. The idea is that you can bend some bamboo uh, elements to obtain um, the large deformation format shape you can see here and uh, and um, you can obtain basically a geometric steepness of the system and for in this case obtaining some a temporary corridor. Uh, we are working, you can see, on these numerical models in OpenSys. OpenSys is working as well under large deformation, is working very well. We will present these results in the YAS conference uh, this year in uh, UK. And you can see we have as well a prototype. So I can show you only some uh, simple analysis, uh, only to show you before maybe I have only some minutes because I think I'm running a little bit too late, but in any case, this is another example of frame, you know, you can realize parametric with the same approach, you know, as I've shown you before, you can see here, here we exported our model in STQ, you can see and you can basically produce whatever structure, but you know, as well, you can realize we are doing some stochastic analysis now on some um, trust system, and you can see that uh, you can have a full control and you can have the output at the end in whatever software. Um, this is finally, you know, I would like to show you uh, this problem, okay, where I want to show you the capabilities, okay, of modeling of open seas under large displacement. Uh, many people are not so uh, familiar with the corrotational approach and with the capabilities to uh, handle uh, the large displacement in open seas, but I think this is very impressive and this is a very important part developed in open seas. This is an example, again, developed with the same philosophy. So MATLAB is running open seas. In this case, the simulation. Uh, will take a little bit longer time uh, because, uh, you know, it's computational, um, a little bit more demanding. Uh, but in this case, you can see that this is a beam, okay? And uh, we are applying uh, very, very large deformation to the beam, you know, to see the large deformation. This is a beam, you know, with a very weak axis. We have a strong axis in the uh, other direction. And you can see that OpenSys can handle these problems very well. Um, this is a suggestion, you know, for the future, you know, and this is where I'm working, you know, to try to use OpenSys to model structure like this. We have some preliminary results, but I hope that uh, this is the master student is working on this project. I hope that for the end of the year, we can submit a good paper describing OpenSys for this different structure. Uh, this is another important question. Let's say the last two questions, you know, are to complete uh, what we can do to improve the US community. Uh, as I said, you know, Pavan is doing a great job. 
Uh, I can tell you what I was trying to do. You know, I studied these uh, open seas courses uh, between Italy and China, uh, my country, let's say, and uh, my second hometown. <laughs> Uh, you can see some example. This is the last two courses held in Turin and Rome, um, while the other two are editions took in Fujo at Fujo University and Nanjing Tech University. I'm thinking to um, as well propose a university a, a course in my university. Uh, we are proposing for this summer. You can see another course in Palermo. Palermo is a city in the south of Italy. Uh, you will find information online on the. Open Seas uh, Facebook page. Um, let's say that's what I'm trying to do for the developing community, try to teach people. And uh, very importantly, in this class, uh, in this course, uh, we, are, we have some session with two guys, in particular, the two guys are Francesco Marmo and Emma Lamalfa Ribolla, uh, discussing about theoretical issues, issues about the finite element model. As I told you, my philosophy is if you want to use a finite element model, please uh, uh, try to understand what is the uh, way in which a, a finite element software is working. And, uh, you know, if you don't know, for instance, the difference, I'm not repeating myself, between a displacement-based and a force-based element, it's quite difficult to understand the difference. And another thing I'm trying to do, but, you know, uh, it's very time-consuming, but I hope that for the next year I will complete this with uh, some friends. We are trying to write an introduction textbook for Open Seas. Uh, you can see starting from the basis of TCL and with the same philosophy containing some information about the theory of uh, beams, a basic theory of beams. So uh, the last question is not a question, but is a conclusion. This is my, let's say, response to the questions. Uh, FEM is needed for structural engineering. It does not exist the best software, but people like simple uh, proprietary software for the reasons I told you before. Open source is generally a valid alternative, but it doesn't not mean uh, free software, remember. Uh, it's not a free software open source, it's a community, something we have to work hard to develop. We need people like Pavan and people uh, like many other uh, guys working hard to develop the community. Open source is, uh, for beginners, seems to be impossible, you know, because coding is a problem and resources are limited, but this is changing very fast, also thanks to initiatives like this. My opinion is that MATLAB and uh, OpenSys can work uh, well, very well together. So I think it's a valid alternative to OpenSys Pi. I'm, again, I'm not saying you don't have to use OpenSys Pi. OpenSys Pi is a very well product, but I think you can do many things as well in another environment. Without theory, it's like a video game. So don't try to use whatever finite element software if you don't know what you are solving, because it's like you know playing video games. It's not like uh, solving structure. And uh, OS generally can solve the multi-physics problem in several ways. I showed you a simplified way I used by decoupling the system, but there are many other solutions. And I think this is a challenge from developer in the next generation to join this software with other software like, I don't know, I showed you, I say the um, software for sawing fluid dynamics problem. Parametric model is uh, crucial for research. So this is something we have to keep in mind. And open source communities need people donating their time and passion, like Pavan, but Pavan is only an example because he's the, let's say, is the host of this section. And uh, last, finally, think before to start, study the problem, know the theory behind, and finally use open source. That's my advice for all the users, especially the user at the beginning. Thank you for your attention. Xie uh, Xie in Chinese, uh, and uh, I don't know if we want to move. Sorry if I... If I run a little bit late, I think no, I'm one hour, fine. right, Pavan? No, and, uh, you know, it's always difficult to predict your time in the presentation, especially when it's around one hour. Um, and if you have any comment, question, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Christopher, for the nice presentation and going through your experiences. Uh, any questions from anyone? Audience, any questions? Maybe, you know, Bavan, it's too early or too late. It depends on the place where they are, you know. So they are sleeping well. Uh, I think, Alex, yeah. Alex, you have a question? Uh, yeah, I was just curious. Uh, I saw you use Sublime for your OpenSeas um, uh, file editing. 
is that your own yes. custom language or is that one you got somewhere somewhere else because it's really nice uh, you mean the um, i didn't understand exactly the question you mean S sorry the uh the custom language that you're using for um open seas in sublime uh it's just i just thought it was really nice i was wondering um it, either if you have that available or if you got it for somewhere. Um. But when you mean the custom language, because, um, so let's say, let's see to get it directly in Sublime. There is a package for Sublime. I don't know if you are aware of this. Um, no, I use Sublime? Notepad++, but I, I, I really like how Sublime looks, so. Okay, this is Sublime, okay. Uh, in Sublime, there is a package. Uh, if you want, I can send you the link. But if we look, uh, yeah, I should have uh, uh, Google here. If you digit open sees Sublime, I'm not sure who exactly developed this. Uh, there is this package here. This is the one I'm using. Okay. You can download this. And uh, basically, you will see the code in this way. But uh, it's... Uh, another important thing, but you can do exactly the same in um, in uh, Note Plus Plus. You can run directly, you know, the code like in this way, you know, mm -hmm. and you will see the results in the back in the oh, down nice. part of Sublime, you know. Yeah, I do something similar in Notepad Plus Plus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you can do the same. Yeah, for the language. So this is the link. I don't know if there is the name of the developer here. I I, I did it. see that one, so I'll just take a look at it. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Zarko. The Zarko. Who is this guy? Let's see. Maybe here we can see the guy. So I mean, it's no. I mean, I mean, it's nice to see you with the developer sometimes. Is this ah? Yeah. So you know the guy, Pavan? No, no, no. I just saw the name. Okay, so the contributors are this uh, Boria Zarko and then Lin Dong. So, I mean, only to, it's good to say who are the developers, right? And uh, very importantly, yeah, I like the view here. In fact, I'm always coding here uh, for my TCL code. Um, and, you know, in MATLAB, you know, basically I'm running the code, you know. Uh, I didn't provide many details, but generally, you know, what I'm doing, you know, is to create the model and uh, I have my scripts, you know, to write the different parts of the TCL code, you know, in a way like this, in an automatic way. Uh, this is one approach. Another approach is only to write some similar to what I show you here. I'm writing only a few lines of the code, like uh, this one. Uh, only providing some few inputs and then, you know, the remaining dirty job, let's say, is made within the TCL framework. Thank you. Cool. You are welcome. Uh, any other questions from anyone? People take time initially. <laughs> So, so you are so all your students also work on similar or like they work on open spy or something like that directly and you struggle then to look at their code i know some you know some students are attracted by you but i'm not struggling with open sys honestly mm, the problem is not use python you know uh, yeah. the problem is that um, i don't know if i explain clearly when you use the uh, yeah. matlab for 10 years and or something like, or a little bit more than that you know you have everything in matlab i don't know how to explain so it's yeah, like no, uh, I, uh, um, I mean python is in many cases you know it's quite similar to, to matlab yes to matlab yeah it's not so different but um, i don't know uh, sometimes i'm working on simulated uh, earthquake time histories okay yeah, uh, I know it's not so difficult to program by yourself, and maybe you can find the package. But I have my own libraries in MATLAB. Uh, I'm using this for teaching sometimes, you yes. know. Uh, and I know now exactly uh, whatever is going within MATLAB, you know, because I have a full control after such. Uh, I mean, with all, with this long experience. Um, Python, I'm using it. I'm really appreciating, I think, the key important... I think the, the main reason to use OpenSyspy, okay? Because I think this is the key point in the discussion. Um, honestly, I don't feel that post-processing is the key and most important part. 
because I showed you some example like this lovely software OS slide developed by Jack Chen. Uh, this is working very well in the TCL environment. So you can see your model very well. I showed you some other example of post processors you can develop by yourself in MATLAB. It's not so difficult. I mean, uh, we are not, uh, I'm not a software house, you know, so it's easy to program this again, if you know the theory, because if you don't know, does it work a shape function? Uh, you will never be able to program something like that by yourself. Uh, so I think it's not so difficult to program by yourself. The key reason to use and the key boundary in my approach is uh, the way I'm using MATLAB. So I don't know, this is something interesting and I'm sharing, you know, my limitation in with user is that if I want to change something at some step using MATLAB, I cannot do this with this approach because basically I can, let's say, run the code, ask to the TCL environment, run open seas and run the different steps of the analysis. But I cannot change according to some other function in MATLAB, the analysis at a certain step. Um, maybe there is a different way to connect the two softwares. I'm not sure. This is a question, you know, I'm always open. I, I'm asking also if there is someone in the audience know this. But the key difference I found uh, within the OpenSyspy is that OpenSyspy is embedded in Python. So it's not like an external solver with respect yes. to MATLAB. So at, for instance, you can run a step of the analysis. You can ask to Python to check whatever or inspect whatever uh, parameter at this step of the analysis. And then, you know, you can check uh, or change accordingly to whatever function you have inside Python. Uh, the analysis or parameter of the analysis for the next step. Yes. That's the key advantage now I can see. The second advantage is that from a computational point of view, um, it seems to me that since the uh, open SysPy is embedded inside Python, you don't have the Correct. time you need to call it. So the time I mean yes. to start open Sys. But again, you can manage this. Now I'm doing some simulation for pulse like on structures. And, you know, I solved this problem by creating, I am analyzing basically structures under uh, several paths like uh, events. I solved this problem, this computational time by um, preparing the uh, different uh, uh, time histories in MATLAB, exporting that in an appropriate file uh, that can be read from uh, OpenSeas and then running in a parallel environment inside OpenSeas the different simulations and then import everything in MATLAB. I mean, but uh, the main, yes, yeah. please. So, so the thing was like when you mentioned that like the initial coding civil engineers don't have the experience of coding and all this thing, right? So, yeah. I mean, my only when I was starting uh, to do OpenSeas, like this was the same thing in front of me. As I choose to open Sys and MATLAB or choose open SysPy, be a new user in open SysPy or like you have so much help in open Sys MATLAB. That was the call which I had. But the thing was like, as you said, like I was very new to coding. I didn't know much coding, but the thing it was, the choice was between learning two different things, languages and learning one language and just work on that. That was also a big, uh, deciding factor too. you know the problem is in learning in the learning process you cannot skip learning how to code yes yes but like coding in tickle is completely different from coding in matlab right but here you can yeah, just no python that's the reason because uh, you should study you know what i notice uh Pavan? i notice that for instance people you know in uh, this tickle you have uh, the these three Star brackets possible yeah. you know very few people know the difference between this <laughs> uh, no i i'm sure you are not in this case but i mean very few people no, i have no idea i don't use tickle i, yeah. I never use okay tickle. you don't use people but uh, tickle but i mean very few people i can tell you know the difference between this you know the exact difference i mean there are three totally different concepts you know and they are using randomly this and then they are, or copying some code, you know, from other, uh, from some example and they are not understanding what they are doing. You know, this is only again, the, the title of my presentation is the experience I had, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the typical errors from students, you know, is exactly uh, 
this one, you know. So they don't know the difference because they didn't spend time to study the code. But this is similar for MATLAB. This is similar for or Python, you know. First, start to learn how to code. If you don't know how to code, then, you know, let's say first, the first problem is to understand what you want to model because this is the key point of the story. You know, many people, they have this problem, especially for students. They are not spending time not with a computer, you know, sitting in front of a chair without a computer and say, oh, I want to model this. What should I do? What are the input variables and what are the output variables and this of this problem? What I want to plot exactly at the end, you know? What is, because generally, you know, as let's say what we are plotting, we are plotting some input against some output, right? This is the typical way we are working, right? Uh, so they are not spending time on this. And then it's impossible to model if you don't spend time on this. Yeah. Uh, any other questions from anyone else? Well, okay, we got mm -hmm. some. Hello, may I ask a question? Sure, go sure, first. please. Uh, yeah, thank you, Professor, for your presentation. Um, my, my name is Kai Shinsen, and I'm an incoming PhD student of University of California, San Diego. And uh, I, come out, I, come, I come from Fuzhou, so I guess you have been there before, so that's good. <laughs> Yeah, Fuzhou, and, yeah. Uh, so yeah. You, Fuzhou University, you graduated in Fuzhou? No, I didn't understand. Oh, you are from Fuzhou. Oh, I'm from Fuzhou. That's my hometown. Yeah. Ah, Fuzhou is a nice <laughs> city, you know. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my question is that actually I'm not very familiar with OpenSys. I'm kind of a beginner. So during my past research, I used excessively the abacus so for my research. So I'm a, actually a beginner with OpenSys. So do you have any like kind of suggestions or recommendations for beginners or like do you have any recommended like resources or tutorials for us? I know I know that may, like like in Italy like University of Palermo they offer some like online classes like something like that so some online resources do you have like any recommendations on those? Let's things? say let's say the course uh, I'm co-organizing in Palermo is exactly for beginners. So my suggestion, since it's uh, yeah. uh, a few months later, if you are interested, you can, uh, that's a, surely is a good resource for you. Uh, let's say, uh, this is what we were discussing with Pavan. The first things you have to define is if you want to work on Python or MATLAB or, or TICL, you know, so let's say, MATLAB I mean is an additional tool, but let's say uh, the first question is TICL or uh, Python. Uh, these are the two main distribution of open seas. So are you familiar in some of these uh, languages? These... Yeah, languages or no, let's start. I'm kind of familiar with both, but maybe better at MATLAB actually. Yeah, yeah, but MATLAB, let's say, um, only to, because MATLAB is only, let's say, a way to control or tickle or, you can control potentially as well Python, you know, under, under MATLAB, you know, this is another solution, you know, I showed to, I mean, no, you can run, you know, uh, Python from MATLAB, you know, this is something possible, I did. Uh, no, honestly, because at the beginning I was attracted, you know, by the post-processing, so I used uh, uh, MATLAB as a running uh, Python for the post-processing. Uh, the problem is that there is no conversion between TCL and OpenSyspy. This is another interesting problem, you know, for the future. Um, no, by the way, my suggestion is to start with simple example, okay? If you are just a beginner, you know, um, start with a clamped beam, okay? Uh, you know, uh, I can show you the uh, first yeah. example. I'm. It's yeah, generally I'm... Online too. I can show you... So you can take... Yeah, one. yeah, yeah, but... You can find the example on the web. So on the website, you can find several examples, I mean. Uh, my suggestion is in this moment, I think, I don't know if you agree with me, Open, uh, open Spy, I think is the manual is much better than the main uh, uh, website. So especially in this part here, you can find the example, you know. Um, I think they are very well, well presented, you know. Yes. Uh, if you go to the website OpenSeas, you know, you can go to the user session, documentation. You can go getting started and you have some preliminary example here. 
sometimes I know I started with this one is not very clear, this preliminary example. I can tell you my opinion. I mean, no, it's well written, but you know, some part are not very clear. But in any case, you have several examples here, you know, uh, more advanced examples here or basic examples. You can see, like you can start with the same trust example, okay? Uh, this was provided by Michael Scott, you know, as an example to investigate the uh, buggling behavior. But in any case, you know, what I, let me find my, uh, my, yeah, my lovely word, my lectures, first lecture. You know, what I like to start, uh, this is the first example I'm always providing, you know, to students when I'm teaching is this one. So my suggestion is first, uh, since time is limited, uh, uh, decide if you want to use TCL or uh, um, TCL, okay? I think they are quite similar. I am recently, uh, I have a good uh, resource I can show with you. Uh, let's say I can show you. We recently write a paper for an Italian journal uh, let's say the paper is under copyright, so I cannot show you, but I want to show you only uh, this. So this is the difference in the same code uh, modeled with the uh, TICOL. I can show you only one part. Sorry, the texting is in Italian because it's a paper for an Italian uh, journal. But in any case, we, we describe the difference between uh, Python and uh, uh, OpenSyspy and TICOL. You can see on this table on the left side, the same code in uh, uh, TICOL uh, and the same code programmed in uh, OpenSyspy. As you can see, the commands are quite similar. The syntax is a little bit different, okay? Uh, I can show you here, you can see, this is the, for instance, the code to define uh, the uh, load. So if you can understand basically the logic of the software, I don't think it's so difficult to, uh, migrate migration the migration yes. from uh, TCL to uh, OpenSyspy you know but in any case since time is limited and you know one part is learning one part is experience you know uh, we have to be clear about this uh, you have to try yourself you know to try to understand you know the two uh, part but another problem I can see from students is that they are not starting with this model but you add the look Xin Zheng, right? If you, uh, you know, no, I mean, I'm jogging, but you know, you had the Lu Xin Zheng a few days ago. I don't know if I, uh, I maybe I misspelled his name. I think it's Xin Zheng Lu. Xin Zheng Lu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lu, okay. Tower. Oh, I think this is the tower in modeled in open seas. You know, students sometimes they want to start with this one, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my suggestion is uh, always for learn something, you know, is increasing complexity. If you spend maybe several uh, uh, modes, I don't want to say years, because I mean, what he's doing, I mean, is something if you are a good student, you know, and you're working hard, you can do is not impossible. But I mean, if you start with this, you will never understand. So my suggestion is start with this example. You know very well that the displacement here on the tip, you know, can uh, be uh, calculated as f l cube divided by three e yeah. the elastic modulus i second order moment of financial the cross section and start to compare your model okay with the prediction you know from the theory okay so again if you don't know the theory you will never solve it so start with simple example you know after you solve this you can add this you know after you know this you know very well that you can solve whatever frame structure okay then you know you can move to nonlinear example you can start to create a plastic inch here and then, you know, you can have the diffused or fiber model analysis, you know, to improve your simulation, you know. I don't know what is your, the goal of your uh, uh, PhD studies, but in any case, my suggestion is first define OpenSeas or MATLAB, uh, or TICOL, sorry. Uh, then start with simple example and increase complexity. When you can control the simple example, when I mean control, you can compare with some benchmark number your simple example, move to more complex, complex, complex. And in any case, you know, 
since you know OpenSys is a very good software, but I mean, um, let me cancel this annotation. It's a very good software, but you know, in terms of modeling, you know, you will find in terms of elements, let's discuss about elements, you know, you will see something like this. If you don't know exactly what are the different elements, today I ask you, I mean, to all of you, the difference. I mean, many of you, I'm sure you know very well, but you know, the difference between displacement based and force based element, that's not a problem of OpenSeas or whatever software you're using. It's a problem, you know, of. Uh, a, of uh, knowing the theory. You know, recently I'm modeling with another, uh, well, let me try if I can find with the students, we are modeling some 3D printed, you know, uh, steel 3D printed elements, you, you say that, Bacchus, and the student, you know, is modeling, you know, this, uh, their honeycomb structure, steel 3D printed is modeling this, you know, inside Abacus. I mean, you can see it's a very nice simulation, but you know, at some point when I was discussing with him, he say, oh, how did you model the backlink? He say, no, there is no backlink here, but you can see very well that in this model, we can see very well that this element is backlink. So, I mean, it's not a problem. The student is learning, so I'm not complaining. I mean, that's normal part, pro the normal process of learning. But if you don't know that if you change it within uh, Abacus, the nonlinear displacement setting, you will obtain backlink. Uh, you know, this is something you will not know. I think I found very, very interesting the last uh, post by Michael Scott, uh, uh, with, uh, where one guy suggested how to uh, analyze the backlink because, you know, many people are thinking that OpenSys cannot handle backlink. But the real story is that... Uh, um, OpenSys in the normal version cannot handle the uh, linear version of the backlink or let's say the non-linearization and the solution of the eigenvalue of the dumpling of the not dumpling sorry I was thinking about lunch now uh, backlink uh, but you know you can perform a non-linear analysis using the geometrical non-displacement the geometrical displacement, as I showed you before, for the nonlinear displacement, that you can check when the solution is converging, right? When you have a converging, let's say, you have that the solution is moving fast with a small increasing, basically you are in a, a backlink area. So I think what you ask me to learn OpenSea is the suggestion as the following. First, if you are solving static problem, uh, you can start from the paper from Filippo Spacone, you know, the first paper about the beam theory. Then, you know, there are thousands of good papers describing the uh, how to solve in a finite element. Uh, I suggest you to study a finite element book. If you are studying and dealing with the dynamic problem, start with the Chopra uh, or Pension or whatever structural dynamic book. After you know the theory, I mean, I, or you have a good understanding of the theory or simultaneously, let's say you can start to decide the platform, Python or Pickle. Um, I again, I cannot see very strong differences. The main difference is that you, if you are planning to change the uh, some parameter during the simulation, uh, sometimes in Python is easier because you can easily program, you know, some additional things. While Tickle is a little bit more complex, especially for signal processing things. I mean, Tickle is not so advanced as Python and MATLAB, but for other things, is a very stru well structured math language. And, you know, start with simple problems and increase the complexity of the problem. Well, then, you know, maybe I can ask you what is your project, you know, because if you don't tell me what is your project, it's difficult to suggest. I haven't really started yet, but we have discussed, I've discussed a little bit with my supervisor, so it should be some, should be a topic of low damage structure systems and uh, the study of connections. So I think, we have a high chance of using OpenSys for our research. So that's why I'm here, actually. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. So you are planning to do some tests? I, I mean, think we, we have we, some experiment. I think we're trying to uh, com com combine experimental testing and uh, numerical simulation and try to compare the results. I think that's what we want. Yeah. OK. But, when, but very since I haven't started yet, so, so it's just like a yeah. very beginning stage. <laughs> that's very interesting so if you want to join experimental this is something interesting 
I show you during, but another suggestion is to learn how to, because another problem in matching, you know, the experimental testing uh, with, uh, with the numerical analysis is how to define the constitutive law of the material. Um, an important class of uh, materials you can use is the so-called phenomenological material for the hysteresis. So this is, I show something, you know, I was very fast, but you know, the problem is how to find the parameter for reproduce some experimental results. Um, this is a very interesting problem. And I think in this case, you can use some differential evolution algorithm. Uh, or you can use in general some genetic algorithm also whatever optimization algorithm to find the objective function. But this is something maybe you should go through um, because I think if you want to match this, uh, it's quite interesting. Then I think it's, uh, I think one Shu Wang is connected, right? So you can add something about hybrid simulations because I don't know if you are planning uh, uh, to... Uh, to do some hybrid simulation, but maybe you can add something about hybrid simulation. So this is hybrid simulation means when you have a physical and uh, a physical a physical and a numerical system and you want to join them together. I mean, there is a platform named OpenFresco, uh, which is used for this, but I think it's quite interesting, you know, to think about possible strategies, you know, for joining physical and numerical system. And OpenSys is working very well as well in this area. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> in any case, you can join Palermo and you know, you. I think this is also a way to find a community. You can send me an email, you know, whatever you are interested, you can, I mean, potentially ask me, okay? Or you can ask in the open, uh, Facebook is also as well a very good community. I don't know if you are in China, I know sometimes it's difficult to access. Uh, I know there is a very big QQ group. I don't know if you are aware about this for open seas. I don't know that, so if you yeah, can share there is a very huge so. QQ group, you know, and maybe you can ask information as well as there. It's more a Chinese community, you know. I, I am there, you know, sometimes I'm reading message, but I cannot understand very well. You get <laughs> Any other questions from anyone else? Yeah, I if not, then we can... So I can stop to share my screen, maybe yeah. how to stop. I think... Uh, there are no more questions, Christopher.